Hello and welcome to this audio commentary for Whistle Down the Wind. I'm film historian Robert Ross and I'm joined by the star of this film, Hayley Mills. Hello Hayley. Hello Robert. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Good to see the movie again. And there's the back of Norman Bird. That's right. That's a great back view. So on this film, you were working with uh, Brian Forbes as your director, and it was his first film as director. Yes, um, and, in, and he really did a wonderful job. He, uh, originally, I think I'm right in saying it was Guy Green was going to direct it, and, and then he dropped out, and then Brian took over. Um, and did a great job. I think this was the first day. I think this was definitely the first day. And these locations, you were filming, was it February? So it must have been <gasps> cold. <laughs> oh, yes. Very cold. Very cold. Very windy up there on those hills. Very, very muddy. Mud seemed to be everywhere. Mud sometimes would be up to your armpits. I remember Dickie Attenborough, who produced the movie. His Rolls Royce got stuck in the mud once. <laughs> <laughs> um. Was it a long shoot? How long were you up there? I think we were up up there for six, about six weeks. Mm -hmm. But I'm not very good on timing of things. I don't really remember, but I think it was about that. It was a little little village called Clitheroe and it was nestling at the foot of the Pendle Hills in Lancashire. The Pendle Hills were famous for, at one time, having a lot of witches. The witches of Pendle and the witches were burned. Um, they were probably just women who knew about, you know, folklore and herbal mm. medicine and things like that. But, um, and um, the village was very remote, which was wonderful for this story because it was originally a story uh, written by my mother. Um, and the three children were loosely based on my sister, Juliet, my brother Jonathan and myself. And the story was set on a farm in the south of England, sort of Sussex. Um, however, when the idea was mooted to, for it to be a screenplay, um, Keith Waterhouse and Willis Hall, who wrote the screenplay, I think were, were inspired when they set it up north in a remote part of Lancashire. Um, yeah, because the book was <coughs> based in Sussex. Yes. And this is very sort of isolated, isn't it? I mean, I think you can yes. appreciate these kids wouldn't have TV or anything outside no. to influence their, their view on the world, I suppose. And they have, you know, they're left very much to themselves. You mm. know, the adults are getting on with, with their work. Dad's running the farm, virtually single-handed. Um, except for Norman Bird, <laughs> who's busy trapping pigeons. Uh, and this little village, is the, the, you know, this is Clitheroe, and it's still pretty much the same today as it was then. Uh, I expect the Sally Army still plays there. Uh, was your mum involved in the scripting at all? Or I don't believe line? she was. Okay. I don't believe she was. It certainly... The children were, were much more um, simple, but... The children in the book were a bit more sophisticated. <clears throat> it's an awful word to use to apply to children, but um, the boy uh, in the film, our Charles, in the book, he was known as Poor Baby, and he smoked and rolled his own cigarettes. And um, <laughs> the character, um, the middle girl... Which I guess was based on you. Which I suppose was me. 
based was her name was Brett. <laughs> <laughs> and the um, the elder the elder girl her name was Swallow, and they were all had these weird names because their mother was keen on birds. Okay. Brat apparently was because she was named after a, a bird called Brambling. There is a little brown bird called Brambling and became Brat. So the, the, the children kind of morphed into these marvelous northern children, you know, independent little beings. I, I think you know, exemplified by that little boy in a peak cap. Mm. Um, that little back view. I mean, those were his own clothes. That's what he wore. Those boots, that Macintosh, that haircut, that was him. And that was Alan Barnes. So where did Alan, did uh, um, Richard Antebrough and Brian Forbes go around the local schools? Well, they did. They, they went to all the local schools and, and looked at hundreds and hundreds and, and then picked out, uh, you know, Alan Barnes and um, um, Diane Holgate, yeah. who played Nan. And the other disciples, all local, except for Roy Holder, who was uh, already a professional actor. Um, and he's still a professional actor. Yeah, we'll see a bit more of the way later on. Uh, and there's Bernard Lee playing your dad. Was he fun to work with? Oh, darling man, yes, yeah, sweet, sweet man. I love the way he, he was wearing his old army, army jacket and army berry. Um, yeah, this is, I love, this is a great moment. <laughs> <laughs> It's such a wonderful little figure. What have you got under your coat? Miss Woolworth! So I was an experienced actress at this time. You, this is your fourth film, I think. Um, were you privy to who was going to be cast as your brother and sister? Or? No. 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 What, you mean, was I in on the casting? Yes. <laughs> no. No, I wasn't. Well, they did it all up here in, in, uh, in Clitheroe, um, which is near Burnley in, in Lancashire. Yeah. We were staying in Burnley. And this is Warhorse Farm, um, near Cliveroe. Yes. I'm, I'm sure that if this, this, I mean, if it was in black, if it was in colour, it would, it, it would be a very different sort of movie, because the colours of that part of the world, you know, and it was, but it was deep in the middle of winter. Hmm. Cold, mud, no leaves on the trees. Um, Have you been again? No, we haven't. I'm, I so love black and white. I'm, I'm so enamoured of it. <laughs> we discussed on the Tiger Bay um, commentary that the photography is so sort of um, uh, appealing, isn't it? Yes. So, so. It, it, you don't watch a black and white movie and wish it was in colour. No. I mean, there are some subjects when you probably would, you know. I mean, if you were watching Trooping of the Colour in black and white, you'd feel a bit disappointed. But... Or snooker. Yeah, <laughs> quite. <laughs> yes. And this barn was there, it was right there. It was all all the real stuff, the real barn. And... Um, so it was a working farmhouse? Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you say so you were staying in, in Burnley, which is obviously very close to this place. Mm -hmm. um, but these two local kids, presumably, were, were they farm kids or were they from the local village? Or? Um, they, were f they were local. I'm not sure where they lived, but it wasn't far. Um, um, and they, they were marvellous. And, and, uh, and Alan was a very, very independent-minded little, little chap. I <laughs> yeah. forget, the first day we... Um, walked onto the set, there were three chairs lined up, and one of them said Richard Attenborough, the other one said, um, four chairs, sorry. Oh, how many chairs? <laughs> Richard Attenborough, um, Alan Bates, Haley Mills. Brian Forbes. Brian Forbes, no, it was, anyway, 
Alan Bates is the important yeah, point. Okay. And Alan Barnes, our child, said, Hey, oh, they've spelt my name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Brian said, Oh, I say, I'm terribly sorry. And the next day, the carpenters had, had knocked him up a little chair with Alan Barnes written on the back. <laughs> hey, oh, they've spelt my name wrong. He was outraged. <laughs> But both of them come across so well. They weren't trained that they were just literally handpicked from the schools. And, yeah. Because they looked right, I guess. And, um, and and Brian was was great with them and great with me, great with great with them all. And you know, often when we were doing like these, sometimes these scenes in the barn, uh, when we were rehearsing, he'd leave the camera running, or they'd start the camera and before the kids knew that that it was running so he got everything yeah right. so he got he didn't get that kind of self-consciousness and um and our charles uh, had a bit of trouble with his adenoids at the time and so um he used to have to blow his nose before every take say blow your nose charlie I <laughs> blow his nose <laughs> because he was always a bit banged up not clean you haven't so was this was studio, this wasn't inside the actual farmhouse? Yes, this was studio, mm -hmm. this was Pinewood. And um, um, we did this after we'd done all the lo location shooting. Bernard Lee. Elsie Wagstaff. Uh, Elsie Wagstaff. Was his sister there? Went on to play Miss Hathaway in Crossroads for many years. Oh, right, yes. I'm on your sister, of course. So it was mainly obviously on location. It must have been what quite a short time at Pinewood. No. Yes, I'm, I'm sure it was. <laughs> Just say yes, Amy. <laughs> you keep asking me about <laughs> times, and I, I. I'm sorry, I won't do that. Anymore. I don't know. I mean, what? Three, four weeks? Yeah, because I think I think this, the actual whole schedule was ten weeks. So I'm guessing, was it? yeah, I'm guessing maybe maybe eight of those or seven of those were up on location, maybe three down here. Now we were talking about Alan Barnes uh, over lunch and before we started doing this, that he's come back into the business the last year. So, so. I believe. I'm absolutely, absolutely thrilled. Um, and uh, he's, he's in a film called Love Actually. Um, and it's wonderful news. I, I, I would love to know what prompted him to do that. I did see him about... 29 years ago, <laughs> um, okay. when I, I, I met him again, I was, they, they, they caught me for This Is Your Life, mm. and Alan and Diane came on to the uh, programme. And, and I remember that Diane was married and was working in a bank at that time. And Alan was working, uh, he was working in a factory um, in Burnley or near Burnley. And he was terribly tall and terribly thin, with exactly the same face. <laughs> and, um, and I'm afraid, you know, we rather lost touch. Yeah. Well, Love, actually, he's, he's credited as playing the film director. As a, a people have seen the film, there's a, an interlocking story about uh, two stand-ins on a movie set, and there's a film director there. It's quite a small part, but that's him. So. That's really fantastic. As you see, once you, once you get the bug, absolutely. <laughs> even if it, it, it does take um, a few years. Now this, I guess, is a night shoot again. Yes, yes. Was well, must have been a very bright moon that night. Mm. Well lit. Yeah, and it was great because we didn't have to mock up anything. Everything in the farm was right for the film yeah the juxtaposition of the farmhouse and the barn slightly separate up the hill so that you get that wonderful you know shot at the end of the movie and um i and guess the barn um, was a beautiful old barn it fits the bill doesn't it i guess richard attenborough and brian forbes had done sort of recce yes yes long before this to find the right place one of the great film intros 
Yes. Yeah. Who is it? Of course, sadly, the late Alan Bates now. Jesus Christ. Passed away last year, 2003. Was he uh, a nice person to work with? Yes. He was. He was very gentle and very quiet and very sweet and I, th I think that the, the, his choices in the film were really interesting mm. that he he kept so much of himself hidden he held so much of himself back and you didn't really know very much about the man. You knew what the police were saying about him. Mm. You knew what the children believed him to be. But what was, what was so clever, I think, was that he kept himself sort of... Uh, he was a bit of a mystery. Mm. So it, it enabled the children to sort of impose their idea of him onto him. He didn't get in the way of that. Okay. Until the very end, when the, there is a real connection. It was only his second uh, leading partner film. He'd been in The Entertainer with Lance Olivier, playing his son before this, but this was his sort of first major uh, Role on film, and it's again one of his best, I think, is superb performance. Yes, yes, and he looked so wonderful. Uh, you know, that's how Jesus looked, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Drawn, dark, haunted eyes. Mm. Some wonderful, wonderful shots of him. I think it's hard to believe that they are. There's Alan Bates there in <laughs> picture form. Um, it's hard to believe this is Brian Forbes' first film. So it's such an assured um, directorial performance, isn't it? He's given it's uh, yes, amazing film. Yes, I agree. It's, it really is a beautifully made film. If you really connect with a story with a subject. At, at some point, your intuitive, your instincts about what's right take over. And um, I think I think that that happened very much with Brian and with Dickie, um, that the story was a very potent thing. The whole, you know, and also I think the fact that it was my mother's original story, and my parents, Brian Forbes and his wife, Annette Newman, Dickie Atborough and his wife, Sheila Sim, were all very old friends and had been friends for many, many years. Um, I was going to say, I mean, your dad was making films with Richard Attenborough before you were born, so... Yes, exactly. Also a very close exactly. friendship there. Were you given time to, to, to bond with uh, Diane and, and Alan Barnes at all, or just sort of thrown into the pot together? Um, we uh, didn't make any particular attempts at, at doing that. Um, we, got, we all got on very much, but by that time I was actually 15 and, and quite a lot older than all the other kids. Mm. <clears throat> and... Um, when I wasn't working, I really was banged up in my caravan doing schoolwork. Um, there wasn't quite so much, you know, fun and games on the set when no. I was a little girl. No. Um, and I was, you know, kind of 15, you're kind of sort of teetering on the brink of, of, of womanhood. Just that much bit older that you're sort of away from yes. the fun and games of it yes. all, I guess. Um, and Kathy is that much older than the, 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 the kids, but, you know, 
every attempt was made to make me look shorter and younger. You know, I wore a coat that was a bit too small <laughs> and the arms, <laughs> the sleeves were too short. And um... <laughs> sort of, yeah. Of course, Burnley probably more famous now for him in the James Bond films. Right. Just, He's such just a lovely him. actor. Lovely and a sweet, sweet man and a wonderful storyteller. We used to have the most marvellous evenings hmm. at the Kirby Hotel in Burnley with Brian, Dickie and my my dad and mum were up there quite often um, and Brian is a brilliant storyteller hysterically funny storyteller and we would be crying with laughter and Bernie Lee uh, enjoyed a drop or two yes. and he would often get up and go and play the piano and entertain the entire dining room singing songs frightfully loudly and then he would go upstairs and sing frightfully loudly all the way up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he always, you know, he was always there on the set in the morning though, even if he did have some of his words written on a piece of paper. But a real pro. <laughs> yeah. So this is Worser Hill Farm. Were the owners of this particular farm um, around when you were making the movie, or yes. did you sort of take over the place? No? They do. They were, and um, at least one of their sons is in the movie. Okay. I think he's gone. I don't know whether this location is still there. Have you have you been back? To this one? No, in the years no, since, I no? haven't. But I, I, it is still there. In oh, fact, it is still um, there. Good. In fact, somebody wrote to me uh, just uh, not so very long ago and said they'd visited the farm and sent me photographs of it. Oh, great! And it's exactly the same. Nobody seems to have changed anything at all, which is quite remarkable when you think how quickly things do change. That's such a beautiful shot. Um. Yes. So a lot of time was spent in this barn, of course. And was Alan Bates quite an intensive person, or you say he was quite sweet? But I mean, he comes across as, in terms of his career, uh, a very selective, um, dedicated sort of actor. Yes. Yes. Um, oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, <clears throat> I was only 15 mm. and, um, and because my day was very structured working and then schoolwork I didn't I didn't hang out you know and I, therefore I, I didn't I didn't have the opportunity to have the same sort of um, uh, off stage off screen re relationship um, because there wasn't the time. Mm. And then when you're not working, you, you know, you, you have dinner and, um, and you have to go to bed and then you're getting up really, really early. <clears throat> but years later, I, I hey, met up with him again. Time? Are you wet the bed, the pair, you? And in fact, just a couple of years ago in New York, oh I met him oh after he'd Sticks been so brilliant in, bones, in, uh, uh, in the theatre on Broadway mm. called uh, Fortune's <laughs> Fool. She did with Frank Langella. <clears throat> he was wonderful. We had dinner together at um, Joe Allen's. 198, what? Well, that's how many I've had since He's a great, season. great Come loss. On, don't string it out. I want to get cleared up. Yeah, it's amazing. He's actually, his last film's just come out. We're now recording this in February 2004, folks. But he's just, there's a film called The Statement with Michael Caine, which is his last work, which oh, again yes. is a wonderful, impeccable performance. Again, it's a very small part, but uh, yeah. About. So your no, producer, Richard Attenborough, that. obviously so an actor and prepared. director after I'm this, directed films after this, was he Shall on location all the time? Oh yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, he was an exemplary producer. He was there before anybody in the morning and he'd be there last thing at night. 
Or was that just because his Rolls Royce was stuck in the mud? <laughs> no, he was great. He was great. So very hands-on with the project. Very much so. And that, you know, that, that is the kind of director he is too. He's very connected to everybody and, you know, involved and knows everybody's names and, you know, he it, it just it, it loves it. He's so good at it. I'll do that now then! Norm Bird is fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> great character actor. I'm talking uh, on location. Obviously, I, I guess both Brian Forbes and Richard Attenborough would like to see Rushes. Would they go to some local oh, cinema and screen? Thing? I think that's what they did. Yeah. Yes, I didn't. I didn't go and watch them. Um, I didn't watch the Rushes on this film either. <laughs> Rotten Cows line. A bit strong for Alan Barnes now. <laughs> yes. That's a great moment there. He's a really good little actor. He His timing's good. so good. Yeah. Quite frankly, I think he steals the film. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's. I won't comment on that. But Absolutely he's brilliant. Really good. <laughs> you don't have to follow you. Well, you better not then. And Diane Holgate <laughs> mar married and became Mrs. Paul and didn't act after this at all. But uh, again, she's very good too. Yes. Should we have some fishy? No, that's only a miracle. Of course, you've been in America. Um, before this, doing your first two Disney films. I think that's, did we decide Pollyanna and Parent Trap came before this? I think, I think so. <laughs> I think we were yes. trying to work out the running order. I think you did two films with Disney before this one. Yes. Was it a bit of, bit of a culture shock to come back to England to work in the freezing north? <laughs> uh, it was, you know, familiar and home. Yes, but if you work in England, the cold, the weather is some, one of the things you have to contend with. <laughs> they were very, very sensible to make Hollywood the, the, the hub of the movie industry in America. The weather is great and it's warm Eddie. every day. Eddie. You spend a lot of time on location in England huddling in the back of a car, you know, drinking hot tea and having your feet rubbed, <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> Star treatment. <laughs> And it was sunny. I was going to say, it looks nice weather there. It's a it? sunny day. Yeah. Goodness me. <laughs> Still freezing. No, but my dad says I've got to work more. He says I'm useless and I'm not, see? It's just that nobody lets me. So will you let me? Please let I can tell my dad. Well, I don't know. Do you know how? Yes. Yes, I've seen how you do it. <laughs> this was a, a Beaver film, um, which is which and Brian so Forbes is company. It was sort of the start of this decade of the 60s where English films and British films were very sort of realistic and, um, and and well beaters in a way, although they're still doing very much homegrown material, weren't they? Yes. Yes, I love that. I'll have him. <laughs> love oh, the pigeon. That. Yes. Right. I'll have him. Yes, quite. Yeah. I love that. I, 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 I... More of that, please. <laughs> films about people here and now and you know the, the stuff of everyday life everyday people action movies are all very well and special effects are great and exciting but at the end of the day you just really want to know about people mm. I think probably some British filmmakers made the mistake to try and make American style movies whereas really these films that were very much based around British characters and British sort of um, yeah. ideals they do work yes. internationally. Yes. <laughs> yes. We should talk a bit about music as well, the Malcolm Arnold score, which... Oh, you know, gosh. Helps. It made all the difference in the world, this, this movie. He's, he's brilliant. Brilliant. That, the theme music. The music of Whistle Down the Wind is mm. absolutely uplifting and beautiful. But it also underscores all the comedy so well. Sure. Um, and um, it's like um, he really touched the, the heart, uh, the heart of the movie with his 
with his music. You did the score for quite a few of your films, actually. You worked on The Chalk Garden, which yes. you did with Deborah Carr. Yes. And I think Sky Western Crooked again, your dad directed. And he did Tunes of Glory. Uh huh. Indeed. He did Dunkirk. Yeah. And, and Centrinians as well, which is one of his. Centrinians? Yeah, the did he Centrinians. really? Yeah. Do you sort of get a sense when you're making a film like this that you're making an instant that? classic or no, something that's going to last? Down. No? No. Well, I didn't think in those terms. It's not um, a it's you know, I don't, I don't think, I don't think you do. Because you never know. You just never know. Maybe this is just it a is sweet little film that was not. just going, ah, oh, isn't that sweet? Just disappear. Mm. Um, you know, there's no... Sex in it. Jesus There's no violence in it. There's no bad language in it. There's no car chases. <laughs> it's the kids, it though, really, really, isn't it? Mm. The kids and that, 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 you know, relationship with this man. And, listen, and um, it's a secret. You're not to tell anyone because we don't know yet what he wants us to do. I mean that. Funny little boy, yeah, it's just <laughs> makes me laugh just to look at him. Oh, gentle Jesus. <laughs> There's a moment there when, he, when he's questioning the fact that he's Jesus, and then just in the eyes you can see when he believes it. It's an amazing moment. He really has got such an expression on his face. Yes. Yes. Well, look at that, that's such a brilliant shot, and then brilliant of Sir Malcolm Arnold mm. to. Use this music. Absolutely wonderful. A real joyful shot. Yeah. That was a, it was a honestly that was a, a hard slog up the hill for Auntie <laughs> Mabel. Those little kids ran up there, no problem. I was like <laughs> <laughs> And those lovely bare trees as well. Yes. Oh it's raining now. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, they were slow to mark for a start. Oh, goodness. Well, oh, it's grim up north. Uh, Ronnie Hines. Of course, your independent teaser is a very good man. And there's your detective sergeant Wilcox. And Hamilton Dice. Hamilton Dice. Fabulous, yes. Great. Yes. Still waiting to hear from him about the quantity of guttering that went missing. David Edwards. Oh, look. I think that sticky out as a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> sort of the guinea pig era. <laughs> that, that, that's my second favourite performance in this movie. Like a sort of little Billy Bunter character, isn't he? Um, that's <coughs> Keith Clement. That's the, the actor Keith playing. Keith Clements. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Right now, everybody, close your books. Uh, Diane Clare is the Sunday school teacher. And the, and the little girl with the hat there was completely enamoured of her. She was, she, she just, you know, gazed at her with such love. That was Pam Dyson. This is a, this is one of my favourite moments. Why not? <laughs> he looks like another person has been over the road. Only you're not a good Samaritan, are you? This David? moment. No, no, Mrs. Miss Lodge. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mistake. It's more like a little baby. That was a genuine oh, mistake. Baby, Mrs. Benny Hill, really. <laughs> Miss Lodge. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't he? More like a little baby Benny Hill. Uh, that's what cheeky cherubic look about him. Ah, dear. Now, Diane Clare, for those horror film fans out there, she's got a special place in my heart because she was the star in The Plague of the Zombies for Hammer. And she worked with Lon Cheney Jr. in a film called Witchcraft in the 60s, too. So. Just for film trivia buffs. Well, it? that's very interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. <laughs> well, Cathy, mm. of course, Jesus has never really left us, has he? Because you were number one box office star at this time, weren't you? Obviously, off the back of Pollyanna. Really? Yes, you were. Yeah. At home? Not bad for 15 years old. <laughs> well. Yes, yes. Only I mean, 
these things come and go, don't they? You know, you're only as good as your, you know, your, the parts you get. Mm. And this, this was a wonderful part. And there's your holder. So when was the book published? Was it a long time between book and movie? Um, I think it was a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, again, as you've probably gathered, I'm not very good on dates. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't written with a movie in mind, it no, was written just no, pure no, as a book. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. But there's a certain amount of, of, of dialogue as um taken from the book. Yeah. Um it's um it's very amusing. It's a very funny book. So and a lot of the children in in the book are based on children in our lives at that time. Um, there's a the, the, one little girl, um, very red-faced little girl in the book, funny, funny little girl who's in love with poor baby, who is the, you know, our Charles in the movie. And she was based on Elizabeth Jeffries, who was the daughter of Lionel Jeffries. Um, they, they, they're great, great friends of my, my mum and dad. Um, so, you know, the, the, the children, as I say, loosely, loosely based <laughs> on us. Jonathan, my brother, d didn't smoke and roll his own at No, I was going to ask you about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Artistic licence, though. The old Zephyr, police car. See, another thing about these old movies, they're great. You've got the, the old vehicles and the, the clothes and, again, another sort of social document for this uh, yes. era. Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's... <laughs> it's amazing how old-fashioned it all looks. How much things have changed. Look at her little coat. Mm. Sweet, that Those little coat. Big shoes you're wearing. Huh? Stomping through the mud. Yes. Do you think this sort of age of innocence has gone forever now, Hayley? I mean, do you think you could remake this film? I think it would be very hard. Mm. As you say, the children, there was a radio and that was it. There wasn't any television. When you wanted to make a phone call, as you see in the film, you know, Auntie Dolly has to go running over the fields and into the village, to the, to the, you know, the post office, or he's shut, so she has to go to the, <laughs> to the telephone kiosk. So, you know, imagination for children, they made, they, they played games. What else was to do? Read books, all right, and comics. And lived in the country and, and had so much more freedom. Children were free to run around. I remember we lived in the country, in a little village in the country. You saw children running about in the streets. But nowadays, you don't see children running about un unescorted hmm. by adults. The traffic's too bad, and we're all worried about strange men. Like Alan Bates, for example. Yes. <laughs> Lurking in the shed. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, stable. Apologise. Again, it's quite similar to Tiger Bay, isn't it, when you've got uh, a distinguished actor here reacting to a child or children. Um, did Alan Bates sort of uh, respond to your performances? How do you mean? Well, I mean, he, did he sort of uh, find it difficult to interact with, with children on, on the sort of acting level? I don't think so. No, I mean... I mean, it was a very different character. Yeah. The character of, of, of the man in... in in this movie, you know, was withdrawn. He was, he was in pain. He was totally exhausted. You don't quite know what he did, uh, but you know he killed somebody. You don't know how long he's been on the run, but you suspect it's a long time. Hmm. And 
he's not he realizes quickly that the children are not a threat but he doesn't c communicate he doesn't need to communicate with them um he's not seeking to manipulate them or use them in any way and I, uh, you know, the experience that he's been through has obviously been devastating. Don't tell nobody. And he's, I think he's quite ill. Hmm. Again, those shots of uh, Anna Bates are just brilliantly composed, aren't they? Yes. Arthur Ibbotson was the, the Arthur director Ibbotson. of photography oh, on this. Yes, he's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And you look at him and you can totally understand why the children think he's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Gentle Jesus. <laughs> Talking about um, uh, the book being set in Sussex, when they did the, the musical version, they moved it all to America, didn't they? How do you feel about that? Um... Well, it, it, it was a whole, it, it was a different take on the story. And um, one of the reasons Andrew Lloyd Webber set it in the Deep South is because of the remoteness and of a certain sense of it being a little bit out of time. Hmm. The, 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 you know, the world was sort of had to kind of like passed it by in a way. This part of the country, um, and because he wanted to bring in the element of, of, of the, the sort of the religious element and and, and, and other, other characters, and make it his own. I think uh, you know it, it, uh, that was a part of the. A part of the thing that that, that inspired and, and stimulated mm. it was very different but there was a lot of dialogue from the movie <laughs> um, well the actual essence is still there isn't it in the in, yes in the musical version yes and the music i loved the music i loved the music oh <laughs> you know that's that's how you know, kids were, a lot of kids were uh, kept under control in those days, you know, yeah. eat tea and be quiet, behave yourselves. Yes, Dad. So obviously you were saying you were 15 and a little bit older than the other two kids. Were you quite bossy, do you think, or? No? You mean off the set? Yes. No, not really. That wasn't my job. That was Brian Forbes's <laughs> job. He was, you know, he's he was in charge. Did he sort of coax the performances out? I mean, he wasn't a, a, a strict uh, no. taskmaster. No. No. <laughs> and as I said, you know, sometimes he would leave the camera running during rehearsals, and um, Charlie, our uh, Charles, I love Charles's walk. He. <laughs> He, uh, for close-ups, he would be awfully distracted sometimes by, because he could see his reflection in the camera lens. Sometimes he'd get stuck <laughs> and look at it, sort of make faces at himself. <laughs> you, you tell them. No, I didn't tell them. I told Jackie Greenwood. You tell them. I told you not to tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody. I only told Jackie. <laughs> it's great dialogue. Yeah. I think that's from the book, and uh, this where Malcolm Arnold uses his music so well, I think. This little secret, I love it. And then the kids all start to follow. And there's Roy Holder in the middle. Yeah. To all the kids. He's probably best known for playing Ronnie Corbett's mate in Sorry, BBC sitcom in the 80s. Very really good little actor. Yeah, he's Good excellent. little actor, a lot of... Uh, Thought going on. So he was obviously cast down south. Yeah. And, and, yeah. 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 Well, because he he had quite some 
you know, a couple of tough things to do. But, you know, the kids, they all went into their little place and did their schooling, and I went into my caravan and did my schooling. And we didn't hang out enough. I mean, obviously, when we were shooting, mm. we did, but... Um, Jesus. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, you know, you're quite regimented you when you're a, yeah, when you're a child and you're, you're filming your because you of the demands of schoolwork. Um, it's, it's not a holiday camp. And also, they're getting on with working and you can't interrupt or interfere mm. or if distract. I um, if I let you see him, it's got to be a secret. Was it long hours filming? It's got to promise. Oh, yeah. Mm. It's got to oh, be a yeah, secret because you, you know, you get up before the, before the light. <clears throat> Always difficult for me. And, um... Now come and take him away again, like last time. Um... Uh, Do you understand? The first morning on this movie, I had had the window open in my hotel room, and I woke up with a stiff neck. My, my head was all Can't lurched to the I side. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I had a stiff now, neck all day. Um... And then... The drive to the location was probably about 45, 50 minutes. Mm. And then make up and all that. And then you'd start probably about eight. And finish it. Whatever. Yes. I love this. <laughs> His little Keith Clement almost looks into the camera there because he's been told off, but... Uh... Lovely. I love the way he uses his hands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah it was. So long hours, yeah. Yeah, yeah, long day. It's just a beautiful location, isn't it? I mean. Yes, great. Great. You're all to wait here until I say. And keep back out of sight. Nan, give me the stuff. Oh, this is really before children's fashions kicked in. <laughs> Look, everyone's wearing... Well, Hand-me-downs and things. Like Hand-me-downs yeah. and those raincoats and wellies. I won't be these like I promised. It would all be, you know, oh, sneakers and baseball yeah. caps today. <laughs> Send our Charles. Charles? My little brother. Oh, yeah. So you said your parents were up there, you were still being chaperoned uh, oh, making this particular film. The they were up there a lot, I mm. think. How many are you then? I think oh, they were up there. I don't know if they were up there the whole time. I don't think they were up there the whole time. I, there was a, you know, I had a, a teacher. A guardian who, you know, whose job it was to make sure I did my schoolwork, which was a bit of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, was that a legal requirement on making a movie if you were yes, underage? Yes, yeah. you were supposed to do four hours a day, okay. but um, it wasn't always, it wasn't terribly strict. It was much, much more strict in America, but... <clears throat> But it wasn't quite so strict here. It was, you know, you tried to if you could. But it's so difficult to... You've got half an hour to go in and do some maths. Mm. You know, uh, OK, call on to the set. The, the priority was the filming. Schoolwork had to fit itself in. Um, it must have been terribly frustrating for the teacher trying to grab their charges who didn't want to be grabbed. <laughs> I'd much rather have another bun and a cup of tea. <laughs> um, so I had my own teacher and then the kids had, you know, I was sort of like in splendid isolation in a rather rickety old tin caravan. Um, <clears throat> and Alan had his caravan and we were down the hill behind some trees and okay. the mud was extreme. We had duck boards between the caravans. <laughs> the glamour of filmmaking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
You've worked with some great uh, filmmakers, but I think we ought to, to mention uh, for a few moments uh, working with Walt Disney. Yes, one of the great pioneers. I know it's completely off left field, but you come from America working with Disney. How did you find him? Well, Disney was, uh, he couldn't have been more lovely and, and generous. And he was just wonderful to me, wonderful to my whole family, actually. It was really great. Um, you know, the, the, the Disney Studios was very small comparatively to what it is now. And, and it was, you know, people, I'm sure you've heard talk about the Disney Studios like, like being a very family studios. Mm. And it was. And he used to walk about, <clears throat> go down to the sound stages and seemed, he knew everybody's name. So I mean, he was pretty tough too. He would suddenly say, you know, hello, Fred, you're fired. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, people loved him. I mean, he was, he was a very hands-on, he was a, he was a visible boss. Hmm. He was, you know, he was the boss. Oh, I, 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 I loved him. I was, I really loved him. Just... And he took us all to Disneyland. He just uh, okay. turned up outside the, the hotel, uh, we were staying at the Chateau Marmont, my mum, dad, Jonathan, and drove us all down, drove, drove us in his own car. <clears throat> and we spent the weekend at Disneyland. <laughs> and he loved Fantastic. Disneyland. He had an apartment there. The stranger paused. Yes, we have a lot of great people in film. He's sort of gone through the mill a wee bit with people saying he was a a strange man or a bad boss or whatever, you read sort of these stories, don't you? It's nice to hear firsthand that he wasn't. All I can say is, all I really can tell you is my personal mm. experience with him. And he was, he was lovely to me. And um, to, as I say to my whole family, uh, he, he particularly loved my mum, thought she was very funny, which she is. She was only 17. Because the studios are all that sort of dopey drive and Mickey Mouse Lane and stuff, isn't it? It's yes. a sort of <laughs> real fun factory place. Yes, yes. Different to uh, Clitheroe. <laughs> oh, very different to Clitheroe. <laughs> <laughs> and he used, to, he used to eat in a small private, uh, well, no, a small sort of like the executive restaurant. And then there was the cafeteria where you, where you went round with your tray and collected the food yourself. And, and I often used to go in, he used to call me in and I used to say, have lunch with him and whoever he was having lunch with. Um, he, was, he, was, he was a darling and his wife, Lily, was... <clears throat> we used to go and watch movies in his movie theatre. Oh, that's grand for you. Very, very grand. <laughs> the, the seats tipped back and just at arm's reach either side of you was an enormous bowl of candy and behind there was a soda fountain he'd make ice cream sodas all the way through the movie <laughs> fantastic <laughs> she just mentioned Howard Douglas there as the vet he'd been making films since 1934 has he really mm. goodness you are a Fond of and information. Really. Bizarrely, according to, to records, he's still alive, but I find it hard to believe he was oh, born in 1896, but, you know, possible. Yes. That's <laughs> very, great. very old. And still working, he's I still hope. working. <laughs> Juvenile lady, isn't he? I think once they're prone to colic, you better them early on, but it's up to you. There's nothing wrong with her now. Um, that... If you take my advice, that's the best thing. And you went back to the Disney Studios uh, quite recently doing some Parent Trap sequels, is that um, really interesting to do? That was about 12 years ago. Oh, was it that long ago? Okay. Yes, yes. So you voiced a character in The Black Cauldron as well, haven't you? Uh, one of their animations. It was um, The Troll in Central Park. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, because... The uh, Stu Krieger, who wrote the screenplay, wrote the screenplays for the Parent Trap sequels. Right. Um, okay. And he's become a great friend, and um, and he's 
still works a lot for Disney. And um, did you notice a, a big difference without the master's touch around? Yes, yes, yes. I was very aware of his, the, mm. the, the, the empty space. Um, it's a very different place, of course. It's, it's ten times the size. And, and, uh, um, and therefore, of course, loses that intimate feeling. Sure, yeah. That's the great thing about studios in this country. Pinewood, Shepperton. Um, uh, they're they're big. They've got bigger, but there's still a personal, intimate kind of feeling about them. It's it's really lovely, marvelous history, history on every sound stage. I'm watching this, this lovely scene here. Would you rehearse these quite a lot with Alan? Only on the set, mm. uh, not off the set. Sort of, I don't know, is an intangible, I don't know, there's magic about this film that you just can't quite put your finger on. It just works on all sorts of levels. Yes. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's just a perfect little film, really. And that's young Barry Dean playing the baddie. Barry Dean, but and and he was a local lad, wasn't he? He's very good, isn't he? Yeah. 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 He's got quite a big part in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lovely playground. Probably all built over now, is it? I don't know. Probably. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Yeah, he was good at being the being the villain. He's got that sort of little uh, bit older and the yeah. bully. Sort of flashman in Tom Brown's school day sort of yeah, look about yeah. him. This is the betrayal. <laughs> Was there a big uh, premiere for this film, do you remember? Yes, the first premiere was in Burnley. Oh, okay. The world premiere was in Burnley, which was really lovely. <laughs> you haven't, have you? Yes. Have you? Yeah. And I guess another one down south, isn't it? Yes. A more gitsy one. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I haven't seen Jesus again. Hmm. I haven't seen Jesus yeah. again. Denying Jesus. It's a very sort of meaningful scene again, this. I haven't seen Jesus. Have you worked with Roy since? Roy Holder? Roy Holder? Yeah, have you worked with him? No. Since this film? No. <laughs> Who else has seen you? Who else then? Come on, who else? I have. <laughs> this was really hard for him to do. <laughs> yeah. And, um, he did it a few times, you know, and he was scared of hitting me too hard and so for the close-up Brian hit me okay he gave me a real wallop <laughs> and uh, I couldn't cry because she wouldn't cry but as soon as the shot was over I burst into tears <laughs> <laughs> It's very 
very hard to hit somebody in the face. Well, yeah, I mean... It, 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 you well, have you don't to... mean it, I suppose. It must be. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> you have to get your wrist... You know, you have to have a bit of a limp wrist. <laughs> if you know what I mean, exactly, yes. Yeah. I get your meaning there. You know, and you've got to... You've got to really get your distance right. And the person who is being hit has to go with it, but not preempt it, obviously. So that, I mean, and it's very hard to do in the theatre, because A, you have to do it every night and your face starts to get a bit bruised. Um, but, but, one, but if you practice and choreograph it, the, the, the smack, you can really make it look really good. Mm. Um, and it is better to connect than to pretend. Because that never really looks convincing. But it hurts more. Well, it does, but if you go with it, um, yeah. actually, your cheek can take quite a lot, as long as it is on the cheek and not on the ear or the nose. Imagine kids now listening to this DVD, trying that at home, <laughs> smashing each other around the face. Yeah. Did you sort of see Brian not so much lose it, but but seem unsure what he was doing as a first time director, or, did, or was he on the money all the time? No, I was. I was never aware. I'm sure that you know he was, you know, tearing his hair at certain times. It's a huge responsibility being a director, and uh, there's an awful lot of things you have to consider. I love the way he picks his way through the. This is a, yeah, very emotional scene. Um, but like um, Alan Parker on Bugsy Malone, you're working with he's working with children on his first film. Must have been a sort of to get all those elements to work together so yes. naturally. The, the, I mean, obviously, you know, as we've said before, the thing about the great thing about children Daddy, is, Daddy, you know, if you tell them what's involved and you you're really sensitive to them, clever with them. They're the best thing to look at on the screen. Mm. Um, Because they're so natural. And he didn't do line readings or anything like that. And he said as much as he possibly could to illustrate what was going on, you know. Um, and, you know, our Charles saying, you let it die, you let it die, that, you know, that was, he had to get up to quite an emotional pitch. Mm. I think this is my favourite shot in the picture of um, what, the, the backs? these back views. Yeah. It was so clever to just have this whole scene on these back views. It was the back of his little neck. Mm -hmm. And that little jacket. It's like a, such a little serious little back view. Like a little it? old man, really. Yeah. Like, yeah. Susan, what are you just doing? With? Oh, gentle Jesus. <laughs> he does things for other people, but he won't do anything for me. Won't do anything for me. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this was just probably just in one take, and you just sat there and did this, did you? Um. Well. No, we did. We did do this a few times. Uh, and of course, they couldn't come round and do close-ups. <laughs> Fall in the water. <laughs> Quite difficult. <laughs> they just left it like that. I mean, it's. Uh, Yeah, it's good back of head acting though, isn't it? Isn't that's, it? That's what you want, yeah. Was it Trevor Howe was the best back of head acting? I think that's really? what people say in the business, yeah. But, uh... they must have had a really good a fine outfit. I, uh, Alfred Lunt was famous for back view acting. Yes. And he he apparently would turn up stage at the most emotional moment. <laughs> well, it's the old sort of radio thing, I suppose. It's leave it to the imagination of the 
as the person yes, yes. hearing the dialogue, what yes. the expression is like. Yes. This is Townerly Hall Cafe. Oh, is that where it is? Yes. Which I think is still there, like this. That was a solid building. This wonderful scene of attempting to get the the, uh, the vicar to connect and really, you know, what an opportunity he missed to proselytize, <laughs> you know, and really talk about it. But of course, he's, he's so he's caught up his, in his lead, isn't he? lead guttering <laughs> and, and all that. You know, he's really a very unspiritual vicar. He's, he's uh, you know, but a worthy man doing, you know, a decent job, but wholly uninspired. Yeah, Hamilton Dice. It's a good performance, this, I think. Very uh, good, very good. Oh, yes, yes. This is probably the, the key right. scene in the movie, really, because the, the kids are, are trying to turn to the adults in there. Yes. Trying to find knowledge and, and what life's all about, and he doesn't know, does he? And there's that great line, <laughs> which is the, the best line in the film, I think. Isn't it? I couldn't agree more, yes. <laughs> and, of course, he doesn't want to have this conversation. He mm. wants to read his book. <laughs> <sighs> Yes. Oh, he must have let some people die, mustn't he? And Hamilton Dice was in Sky Western Crooked with you as well later. Directed by your dad. Right. Yes. <laughs> no, he was, honestly. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, uh, you see, uh, people. Yes. Babies are being born all the time. And uh, <laughs> those of us who are here already. I've got to make room for them, haven't we? Yes, sir. The Lord giveth. Yes. And the Lord taketh away. That's yeah, I think he's reading a thriller there or something. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, I remember when I saw this as a kid, I also thought it was the Bible, but of course, now looking at this, it's not. It can't be the Bible, can it? No. It's some sort of, yeah. It looks two like bit it's got May Gray on the front. <laughs> and I like, it puts it down with such reluctance. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Here's the main point about the lead, you see. It's this. All he's bothered about. Yes. Yes. Do you get letters from children today who've seen this film on TV and been affected by it? I do still get letters about this film. About... Yeah. Yeah. I do. And... Um, but then now there's a whole new phenomenon of collecting, collectors, you know. Right. So I, 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 I get quite a lot of things to sign, like old posters and things like that. And I think, where did they get that? eBay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, eBay, yeah. <laughs> yes. Things that actually I'd love to have myself. Mm. That I didn't know, you know, I didn't even know existed. You see, you don't have a chance to age. see exactly what he did. No. You know he murdered somebody, uh, yeah. but what, who? Exactly. What have you got for me today? A man, a woman? I suppose what? nowadays they probably they'd put another 20 minutes on the, on the time and, and explain all that as a sort of a, a preamble. I love the mystery. Mm. A mystery. So you, you, you make up your own mind about this man. And... You know, it, it was a, a marvellously restrained before. performance. Mm. No, it's not. You know, he's not, he's not trying to win, no. win her over. No, you smoked. It's all done on his terms, isn't it? It's yeah, like, absolutely. If, you know, if you want to help him, that's up to you. Yes, yes. He needs her to get something. Uh, uh, i try and get you something. You know, he's he's got too much in his mind Try to be to too concerned, really, about her or a, a, any of the right? any of the kids. All right, if you don't get caught. You don't. How would your mother say? And he speaks to her as if she was another adult. He doesn't speak to her as mm. if she's a child. Mm. I suppose that's the great the great irony that he's the only adult, really, with a, a sort of. An understanding of what's going on in your head, whereas the other adults are. 
cooking yes. lost, aren't they? Yes. They've been corrupted by reality, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. But I love the way he has to deal with the fact that, you know. What day is it? Of course, yes, I'm I'm Jesus, therefore I'm supposed to know that it's his birthday tomorrow. And yeah, that line, is, as you know. Yes. <laughs> and that, you know. That her mum's in heaven. Oh yeah, mm. like, oh, yeah. Oh, I remember. Her. <laughs> yes. I suppose Alan Bates became a bit of a known as a hellraiser, and you you'd work with the other hellraiser later on, Oliver Reed. <laughs> Take a girl like you. Yes. Is that enjoyable? <laughs> yes, that's a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just I'm, I'm clipping the two because they're famously wrestled nude in Women in Love, didn't they? Yes, Bates that's and right. Reed, so. Goodness me, that's right. Fantastic scene. Mm. Are you avoiding the question about Oliver Reed? Are you... What? Are you avoiding the question about Oliver Reed? <laughs> <laughs> was he a handful? Oh, he was a very different kind of actor. Yes. Uh, he didn't. He didn't like to rehearse, and he didn't like to do it more than once. Um, I do like to rehearse. I like to really know what I'm doing. I don't mind rehearsing. I would rather rehearse lots than do it again and again and again. Um, uh, we had different way. We had a different a different way of working. Would you like to do something else um, with me? Well, you me You know. Only if you do, nobody's to know. We all have our we all have our different. Hmm. Our different kind of methods. But a fine actor, nonetheless. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, he's great gladiator, wasn't he? Oh, that was superb, wasn't it? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. It's just so great that that was that was his last mm. movie. It was a wonderful part to go just, out on. Just didn't finish it. Just that those last few weeks, or but um, yeah. That's what, one time I met him was we, uh, he was on a pub crawl from his home in Ireland to Malta <laughs> for about nine months to get there. <laughs> what a way to go out. Goodness, he had a great capacity <laughs> to enjoy himself. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll drink to that. We're drinking water. Sorry, Ollie. Apologies. 541, 542, 543, 544, 545, 545, 545, 545, Look, Cliff. Cliff, indeed. <laughs> And that would have been there. That certainly wasn't put there by the art department. Great, it's still relevant today, isn't it? Cause totally, it's still getting I know, it's today. wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> Who were your sort of idols? Were you into to pop music and that sort of thing? As a, as a Elvis child? Presley. Yeah, oh, good choice. Completely, totally Elvis. I was madly in love with Elvis. I I did see him. I was going to say, did you ever meet him in Hollywood? No, I didn't meet him. I, I I could have gone to a party that he was at, but I didn't go. I'll never forgive myself for that. But I did see him in a car. We stopped at the lights. My family and I... And I was in the back of the car with my sister, Juliet. And she suddenly dug me in the ribs and pointed speechless. And the car beside us was a white Cadillac with black interior. And somebody was leaning over the person in the front seat, lighting their cigarette. And when the person from the back s sat back, the person smoking the cigarette was Elvis Presley. <gasps> and that was the one and only time I ever saw him. Nearly broke right. my nose, <laughs> slamming it against the window of the car because you always have your <laughs> windows up because you have your air conditioning on. <laughs> goodness, doesn't that look grey and wet and yeah, cold? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it always reminds me of the, of the Hitchcock version of the 39 Steps, this sort of the, yes. the, the hunt for Robert Downat yes. over the moors. Uh, yes. Wonderful. Mm. It looks great. I love that mist, that kind of haunted quality that the North gets sometimes. And train tunnels are always good locations, always sort of atmospheric, aren't they? 
Yes. Yes. So Elvis was your, your pop idol or yes. hero. Um, what about acting in terms of acting? Who did you admire? Um, at that time, Marilyn Monroe. Mm -hmm. uh, I loved Marilyn Monroe and I loved Bridget Bardo. Um, Spencer Tracy. The best. Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> did you sort of pinch yourself that you were actually in the same business as these people that you admire? Oh, yes, mm. yes. And I met some wonderful people when I was in... Yeah, and I was in Hollywood. I met Boris Karloff and Edward oh, G. Robinson. <laughs> I met Lillian Gish. Yeah. Um, What's Karloff uh, like? He's a real gentleman. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Very gentle. Very, as you say, very courteous. So sweet, it was surprising that he was this terrifying monster. <laughs> the uh, yeah. Frankenstein, mm -hmm. fabulous. And I, when when I first went, uh, when I was doing Pollyanna, uh, my sister came out there, or was it the Parent Trap? Was the Parent Trap? I remember we used to watch The Bride of Frankenstein every night on the Late Late Show. And it was so late. We loved it, though. Elsa Lanchester with her hair on that sort of yeah. metal frame with a white streak at one side. And we'd stop during the ads, fall asleep. And they wake up again for the movie and they fall asleep during the ads. <laughs> Saw it about ten times. One of the great films. Colin Clive was the Dr. Frankenstein. Yes. Ernest Sessinger. Yes. Yes. So I'm being self-indulgent, come on, that's, that's my other passion, is uh, the horror movie. Oh, yeah, oh, really? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've just realised that all this army, like his great army greatcoat, and Bernard Lee wearing his army jacket and his army, is that, you know, the war isn't that long ago. It's That's only right. 15 years or so. 15 years mm. ago. So, he's still got all, the, all his clothes. I love Bernard in the paper hat as well. Look at me. I mean, in Congress. What's not here? Mr. Drunkett, mustn't you? It's never passed my lips. I haven't had a drop since VE Day, and I didn't like that. He's in there. V.E. Day. Victory in Europe Day. Mm -hmm. For the kids watching. <laughs> good actor, such a good actor. So the hotel was, was yourself and Bernard Lee, Brian Forbes, Richard Attenborough. Alan Bates. Alan Bates. The other kids, I guess, were just... They went home. They went home, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. And they missed out on old Bernard Lee's stories then. That's a shame, isn't it? His sing-alongs. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Oh, it's cake time. Everybody who wants a bit of cake, queues up in front of Auntie Doris. <laughs> He has such a lovely quality. He was, yeah. he was so very much the dad hmm. of, of, of those kids. It's the Jesus. Oh. Brilliant shot. Realisation. That little boy, I think I'm right in saying, is one of the sons of the people who owned the farm. OK. Yeah. I love this moment coming up now. Charlie sitting there all by himself. It isn't Jesus. It's just a fella. Mm. The final... And this is a brilliant bit of Brian Forbes' direction when the, the adults' realisation, it's all in long shot. You just, yeah. 
running around like you say trying to get the phone and, and whatever but yes. uh, it's a brilliant piece of filmmaking this I think is it uh, odd for you looking back on your recorded childhood like this well yeah, it's very lucky that I can and that as a result it it um, it, it revives so much so many memories and it is true to say that before my first movie before Tiger Bay my memories are a bit fragmented a bit hazy mm. but from Tiger Bay itself and then onward I've got so many movies to connect my life to so my life is sort of like before Tiger Bay and after Tiger Bay. <laughs> Tiger Bay changed everything. Um, and He's got a gun. as I say, you know, you childhood tends to blur into a sort of haze of childhood days. Um, and then that that movie was a real milestone. And of course, he works in films and TV and stage ever since, really. But it's these early films that, I suppose, immortalised you. Well, I was so extremely lucky to have so many wonderful parts and be in, you know, very, very good movies. Um, that's, that's. You know, all one can ever ask for to be to be working with the best people and have you know and have have wonderful parts, and I did in the Disney films and uh, you know in English English movies. Mm. Yeah. Did you have some sort of fan club, official fan club at this time? Were you such a, Not, such a big star? Oh, now. This no, when movie you're making time, the movie. Yes. Mm. Yes, I did. I did. I was getting a lot of uh, fan mail at that point. And I did have a fan club in England run by a girl called Janice Love. OK. Who was very active and very good. And, and, um, um, so how did that work? Did you get like a sort of newsletter? Or? She really did it all. I didn't really do very much, but I did used to spend hours signing photographs <laughs> <laughs> and I got wonderful presents from people and offers of marriage and a cat movie camera a, a monkey skin rug a diamond ring and you name it <laughs> 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 the perks of the job <sighs> all of which particularly the diamond ring I was made to return by my mother. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find that, obviously, you were such a big star that, that people tried to not so much typecast you but, but to keep you young? You said you were wearing um, smaller clothes here to look younger. Did you, th do you feel that you were trying to be kept young by producers? Um... Sometimes, yes. Although uh, Disney tried to tailor the, the films to suit my age. Sure. Um, that Don Katz, a good example, you were putting yeah, sort of more. But there was a kind of a sort of restriction to that as well. It was still within a certain genre. Um, I probably, I probably stayed. Um, uh, I, I had a somewhat, shall we say, protracted adolescence. Because <laughs> you were saying that you, you people were reluctant to show you smoking on screen or drinking. Or yes, yes, yes. Colluding, you know, I had to be very careful yeah. about things like that. The image. This scene um, is. Really, the only time when they really connect, I think, when he really connects with her, 
Well, they do, but it's... I think it really comes home to him. The effect that he... what he means to them. Hmm. And the sort uh, of symbolic brick wall between the two of them yes. as well, so you can't, they can't sort of physically connect, can they? But... Yes. Yes, it's this... It's, it's sort of agony, actually, this scene. You so want... You want more for both of them. Mm. You want... You, you want him to come out of himself, you know? You want him to... You know, he, he feels like a dead man walking. No way. And somehow she imbues him with a bit of hope. Well, he's sort of been imprisoned throughout the whole film, isn't he? He's, he's yes. imprisoned in that, in that environment yes. all the time. You never see him outside the stable at all. Yes. I love this bit when you, when you throw the cigarettes in and you forgot the matches. It's all sort of poignant. Oh. Tear to the eyes on, actually. You're right, he's just admitting defeat now, isn't he? Really? He yes. knows he's, uh, he's finished. But uh, well, yes. uh, one, of the, one of the great moments in British film, I, it gets me every time that bit, I must admit. It's a beautiful moment. Will you forgive him? Yeah. Anyway. But, but I think that, that um, you know, this is the great thing about Alan's performance is that he leaves so much for the audience well, and me, for the audience to... May, he makes us work. It's, he doesn't, it's not all obvious. And therefore he gives the children the opportunity to make him what they have decided they want him to be. Um, he doesn't reveal himself. It's a, it's a remarkably restrained, subtle performance. Mm, absolutely. Until the very end when the police come take her away there must be something you could do you could do anything is that what you all think yes <laughs> yes we all believe in you real tears of course <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that, you know, this child says, we all believe in you. Just saw Joel Sim there, which is Richard Attenborough's brother-in-law, of course. Yes. And John Arnett there, who was uh, the show for Nottingham, with Richard Green's Robin Hood on yes, TV. Yes, yes, of course. Again, just these great actors come in for a couple of days' work, I guess. But you were saying now your character believed in him, and she really believes in him right to the bitter end, doesn't she? Yes, yes. And the effect the children have on him, it is, it is all very subtle. Um, but perhaps they prevent him from being violent and shooting his way out. Perhaps they change something in his heart. Well, it's the old thing about you know, a vision of human kindness, I suppose, isn't it? He's, he's probably been battered and bruised all his life and he comes across your character who's, you know, an innocent spirit without getting too deep about it. Old Sim keeping well out of it. <laughs> you there, Blakey? Gonna be a good lad. Mm. 
Have you kept in touch with uh, Richard Attenborough and Brian Forbes yes. over the years? Yeah. Yes. Um, um, Dickie Attenborough is a very, very good friend of my, of, of all of us, particularly of my, my dad. They go back a long way. And one of his first films was In Which We Serve. Mm. Which, you know, which my dad was in, and, and um, they've been firm friends ever since. Worked together quite a few times. Coming to the near the end of the film now, I suppose it's a redundant question, but are you proud of this movie? Um, <laughs> I am proud of this movie. I, I, <clears throat> I think it's um, very special, a little film. Um, and those two little girls are Brian Forbes' little girls. Oh, right. Yes, Emma and Dara. Um, oh, that's interesting. No, so you are proud, isn't it? It's obviously, what are we now, 40, I don't know, 43 years on. Is it really necessary to say this, Robert? I probably haven't changed a bit. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just to illustrate the power of good filmmaking, really, that uh, good stories never get never. Yes, I know, it's amazing older, it's that long ago. Actually, the whole film is, is so, so beautifully understated. It never becomes sentimental. Nobody does obvious sort of, oh, Jesus, Jesus, I love you, Jesus, kind of things. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't um, give in to the temptation of being a sort of Jesus figure or, or, or anything, you know. He, he has great integrity in the way he played the part. And so it has a kind of real magic about it. There is a magical quality about it, but it's real. It's real. You can always tell when, when it's manufactured, can't you? When there's a, yeah. this is a real, yeah, as I said before, it's a real sort of a atmosphere and, and uh, quality that you can't quite put your finger on. And even at the end, you know, um, now, um, she notices this piece of paper at her feet. And mm. Dad looking around the barn. No doubt amazed that such a thing could have happened right under his nose and he didn't know about it. And then he drops that piece of paper at her feet, the picture of Jesus with the children. And the two little children that turn up are such wonderfully eccentric <laughs> little people. Mm. Little sort of fairy sort of yes. goblin people. Julie Jackson's the little girl who asked the question. Now Julie Hill and Anne Newby, billed as the latecomers. Those big eyes, like a little sort of, those Cupid dolls that she, you know those old Cupid dolls? And there we go. Well, Hayley Mills, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Robert. It's been really good looking at this and remembering it again. Thank you for, for prompting my memory. No problem, thank you. <laughs>